So what do marketers talk about when they talk about marketing? Well, they tend to talk about actions, they talk about activities, they talk about tactics, they talk about the products that they develop, the services they did, that they deliver, how they get this stuff out there, the prices that they charge. So much of the conversation is about what they do, but so little of it is about who they do it to or who they do it with. And of course, I'm talking about the customers. I'm the customer guy, and I want to talk to you about this idea of customer centricity. And it's not what you think. Could you think in marketing professor, customer centricity, oh, I know, I know. You're gonna talk all about how the company needs to surround itself around the customer, and it's their job to make every customer happy. We can't sleep at night until the least happy customer is satisfied. Nah, I'm not gonna talk about any of that stuff over there. I think about those notions about the customer is always right is wrong. I think it's irresponsible. I think it's ineffective. And I think following those ideals is actually way out of line with the best practices that we see across the other parts of the organization. So when I talk about customer centricity, I'm talking about which are the customers that we should be surrounding? Who are the best customers? Who are the customers who are most valuable to us? And what is it that we can do to enhance their value extract some of that value from our shareholders and find more customers like them. That's customer centricity. And it's not limited just to marketing. It really should be a company-wide strategy that if we can figure out who the most valuable customers are, and if we can find ways to use that for product development, sales and service, distribution and so on, we can make more money than if we just obsess over version 2.0 of the product. Now I've written two books on this, this topic. The titles might not be that, that interesting or that diagnostic, but the subtitles, they hit the nail on the head. The first one is focus on the right customers for strategic advantage. The second one, the newer one, uh, implement a winning strategy driven by customer lifetime value. That's really the main thing that I focus on in my research is this idea of customer lifetime value. A lot of people talk about it some kind of, uh, just uh, as if it's just an abstract concept. You can't really do it, but it's fun to think about the different long run value of each customer. It's my job to really do it. It's my job to take this concept and make it real and make it actionable and help it make a difference for companies. Think about it this way. If I can project how long my relationship with you is gonna last, how many transactions or interactions you're gonna have over that horizon, and how valuable each one of those interactions will be, and basically add all that stuff up, I can come up with a pretty good guess of your lifetime value. This is what I've been doing research on for most of my 32 years here on the Penn faculty, but it's getting out of the laboratory, getting out of the academic journals, and bringing it to the real world. Back in 2015, I, I co-founded my first company, Zodiac, and that was exactly the idea, was to take these models and implement them at full commercial scale and educate companies about all the great things that they could do if they knew the value of their customers. And the results were awesome. First of all, it was an incredible validation of the models. They really work. Secondly, it was great to see companies making more money by being able to identify the differential value of customers and then taking the right actions based on the customers. And third, it was really interesting to see such a crazy, staggering variety of use cases. So besides trying to predict how often you're gonna buy stuff at Amazon or how many rides you're gonna book on Lyft or how many hotel stays you're gonna reserve at a Hyatt, look at some of these other applications over here. So we're not just talking about customers doing things over time, but any time we're talking about a different kind of entity, whether it's a customer, whether it's a physician, whether it's an animal, whether it's a library book, and we're looking to see how many times it's done the thing in the past, and we have a desire to project how often will it do it in the future, or is it still even active at all? It's incredible how this simple math can be broadly applied to so many other domains. Well, Zodiac was a great success, but if you notice, I've been talking in the past tense about it, because in March of 2018, we sold the company to Nike. 
that by itself was just an incredible validation. Such an, an amazing company wanting to embrace these ideas, these techniques, and going out there and really changing their own practices. That's been wonderful. But it doesn't mean that my, my passion about customer centricity, that my mission to bring it to all kinds of different companies and organizations has ended. Basically, instead of focusing purely on marketing, let's think about some of the other areas of application. So when it comes to new product development, looking at companies like Electronic Arts, the gaming company, who looks at the lifetime value of each and every of a billion customers around the world to determine which kinds of new games to come up with. Or companies like Mariel, a veterinary pharmaceutical company down in Georgia that uses lifetime value to realign and incentivize all of its salespeople. Or how about this last one over here? Customer-based corporate valuation. Maybe a marketer like me has to say something to the people in finance. That's the nature of my new startup, Theta Equity Partners. As it says here, we're re revolutionizing finance through customer-based corporate valuation. The basic idea is pretty simple. That if we can project how many customers we're going to acquire, and how long they're going to stay, how many transactions they're going to make, and how valuable those transactions will be, we can do a better job than the usual top-down ways of forecasting revenue, determining what the company as a whole is worth, and giving companies guidance as to what they should be doing in order to run their businesses more effectively. I want to share with you just a couple of examples. One of them was one I'm thankful to many of my Penn students for. Back in 2017, I gave my students data from Dish Network, a subscription TV company that many of you might know about. And I said, taking this historical data, I want you to project how many customers Dish is going to acquire for each of the next four quarters. And then we waited. Weeks and weeks after the assignment was done, we got a chance to compare their forecasts with the so-called experts on Wall Street. And it was very interesting. In the first week of May 2017, Dish announced that they had acquired 547,000 new customers. Wall Street was very disappointed. The consensus estimate was 13% higher. They lost a billion dollars of shareholder value in a week. How did our Penn students do? They hit the nail right on the head. Their average estimate was 550,000 new customers, within 0.5% of the actual number. And if we roll ahead to the quarter after that and the quarter after that, just as close. So by bringing in some understanding of marketing, of how customers behave, how they differ from each other, and by breaking down their behavior into these different components that I mentioned, we can do a better job than Wall Street. Let me give you one other example. A company that many of you might be familiar with, Wayfair, big online furniture company out of Boston. Look at these revenue numbers. Wow. I mean, this company is just an incredible Wall Street darling. They're just making all this money. But here's the question. We don't care about how much money you've made in the past. We care about how much money you're going to make in the future. And looking at these revenue numbers, can we go a little bit deeper than that? Instead of just saying all dollars are created equal, let's try to break it down once again into, well, how many customers are we going to continue to acquire? How long will they continue to transact with us? How many transactions will they make? And how valuable will they be? One of the amazing things about Wayfair hasn't only been its financial performance, but their willingness to actually share metrics that relate to some of these customer behaviors. Now, if you think about it, the way that it works with most publicly traded companies is all they reveal to Wall Street is the bare minimum, revenues. Wayfair goes further than that. And I know it's really hard to see here, but they also tell the street how many customers did they acquire in this last quarter? How many total orders were placed on the website? And what was the number of active customers, new or existing customers, who placed those orders? Using that kind of very rich and very unusual information, we can actually break down the revenues into the different behavioral components that I was talking about before. And again, without getting into all the details, it's actually remarkable how well we can take these models and project new customers to be acquired, the length of their lifetimes, and so on. Not get into the details, but if you're interested, here's a paper that I wrote with former Penn student Dan McCarthy that shows how we can take the publicly available data on a company, do this kind of breakdown, and then build it up to come up with more accurate assessments of revenue and overall firm valuation 
than if you had just looked at the raw revenue numbers. So let me show that to you. So here's the basic idea. We have these separate models that are picking up these different aspects of behavior. Now we know that no model is perfect. So we take our models, we take the parameters, and we perturb them a little bit. So we can come up with different kinds of revenue projections. I'm going to show you right here several thousand different possible revenue projections. Uh, the dark line over here being our best guess, but a wide variety of different possible scenarios around them. Some of them are, are much better than others, but all of them have one thing in common. The same basic shape, which if you haven't been forecasting revenue before, and I suspect few of you have, uh, it, it might not be as alarming to you as it is to me. See, usually what happens with revenues is they look much smoother, because usually as you start to saturate all of the new customer acquisitions, there's enough repeat purchasing going on that the company stays really healthy. This one's really different. Wayfair is an acquisition machine, but not a very well-oiled one. They're bringing in lots and lots of customers, but they're doing so in a very expensive manner, and those customers aren't sticking around and buying over and over again as they should. If you look at their own data, the, the, the velocity of customer acquisition is just way, way, way greater than the ongoing repeat buying, and at some point that will stop. At some point, this company will crash. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not saying it's going to happen next year. It might happen 10 years from now. I'm not sure. That's why we have all these different scenarios. But they all paint a fairly grim picture. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take these revenue trajectories, all of them from uh, as of May of 2017, and for each one of them, we're going to do all the accounting and finance stuff to come up with an overall valuation for the firm as a whole. And that's what we see right over here. In May of 2017, the company was trading for about $65 a share. Our estimate across all of these different scenarios, good and bad, is that the company is worth about $10 a share. We wrote a paper on it, you just saw it, and we posted the first version of it to some academic website in September of 2017. Why would anyone pay attention to an academic paper from a couple of marketing professors? Well, it's kind of interesting to see just how much attention it got. The day that we posted the paper, and for a couple of weeks after that, people paid very close attention. It was actually remarkable, the amount of attention that we were receiving from lots of experts on Wall Street. This was the largest drop that Wayfair saw in its overall stock price and shareholder value for several years, and including some of the most familiar faces and names on Wall Street. Some of you might know Jim Cramer from Mad Money. Here's what he had to say about it. Again. When he tweeted his support of an academic paper published by professors at Emory in the University of Pennsylvania, calling it the smartest piece ever written on Wayfair, it did the job, causing Wayfair to plunge from 83 to 70 as of today. What was so devastating about a high-level academic paper? The professors tried to come up with a way to pin a value on Wayfair's current and future customers based on how, many, uh, on how much they make from these customers versus how much they spend to acquire them. Let's think about that for a second. The professors were saying that the best way to value a company is by looking at the value of the customers. Now, again, I don't know how many finance experts that we have here, but I would imagine that for many of you, the reaction would be, duh. Of course, that's the way we should be valuing companies. We should be looking at the customers we acquire, projecting how long they're going to stay, how valuable they are, and adding all that stuff up to say that's the value of the firm. So while we claim that we're revolutionizing finance, some of these ideas are actually pretty basic. Some of these ideas are pretty simple. And let me bring it full circle to wrap up by talking about customer centricity. Remember, my goal is to make this a corporate-wide strategy, not just for marketing, not just for finance and corporate valuation, but I want everybody in the company to recognize that the main thing that we do isn't to sell stuff, but to build relationships with customers. And so that's my mission over here, is to try to make customer centricity this, this well understood, this very desirable strategy. But there's the other side of the conversation, which we're not going to have time to get into today. And that's, what's in it for you? Like, how do consumers react to this? Like, what do you think when you realize that not all customers are created equal? And that companies actually have the capability to kind of size you up and say that whether you belong to the president's gold medal blue ribbon club, or not. 
There's all kinds of implications of these strategies above and beyond just making more money. What kinds of companies, what kinds of industries should be using these tactics? Like what about retailers? Sure, why not? What about financial services? What about healthcare delivery? There's a lot of questions to be answered. There's a long conversation that we need to have. I, I like to believe that I'm starting that conversation. I hope that some of you find these ideas kind of intriguing. Uh, and I hope that it's a conversation that we can continue for many years ahead. Thank you very much.